University's Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation's goal is to connect our viewers with supportive resources in the community and to help individuals enhance their career development and overall well-being. Everyone can be successful with the right support. Good afternoon and welcome to Employment for All. My name is Kim Bissett and I'm here to help you get a job, change jobs, or advance in the job you currently have. Each week we bring you interesting and informative guests to help you learn all about the resources to increase your career development or enhance your overall well-being. And this week is no exception. We'd like to welcome Joan McCullough for the Department of Mental Health and Emily Sherwood for the Department of Mental Health as well. Um, we'll start off every week as we do is tell us about yourself, a little bit about your role, and a little bit about who you are. Joan, could you start us off? I could. Um, I have been uh, with the Department of Mental Health overseeing children's services for more years than I choose to report. <laughs> Very long time, uh, but I'll tell you anyway, it's 26. Fantastic. Um, and I have, a, I have a history as a, a school teacher, a probation officer with kids, uh, a social worker, um, uh, running a treatment program for juvenile offenders, wow. uh, running a nonprofit agency, working with children, children and families, um, and then I came to DMH in 1985. Um, I'm also the mother of a 21-year-old, which I think makes this conversation um, all the more relevant and important from Absolutely. my perspective, because I have a sense of, of what issues our young adults are facing. Absolutely. Well, fantastic. And we should also mention you're a repeat guest. Thank you for being with us again here at Employment for All. Happy to be here. Great. And Emily, tell us about yourself. Um, so my name is Emily Sherwood. I work at the Executive Office of Health and Human Services. And as something I think we'll talk about more, I'm overseeing implementation of the Rosie D, the remedy in the Rosie D lawsuit. Yes. Um, and I come to this work, I've worked in government for about 26 years, as long as you've been at, <laughs> wow. at DMH. And, um, well, what's interesting is in college, I really, I was involved in a lot of social change work. And if you'd ever told me I was going to work in government in my whole career, I would have been very, very upset. <laughs> and um, through, I just happened to get, get a job in the legislature. Some people may remember Senator Jack Backman, who was an incredible champion for people with mental health issues. Wow. And um, I was amazed at the really wonderful staff and legislators who were actually able to make good changes for people, and I really got hooked. And so I worked in the legislature for a little over 10 years. I got to work on the health care reform bill. And then I've also been, I was at Medicaid for um, about 10 years, where I worked on a couple of pilot programs that really set the groundwork for the new um, remedy services, and they were pilots of um, uh, completely integrated care management and, and service programs for kids, something called MISBE, and then coordinated family-focused care. So um, when we needed to implement the remedy, because of my experience helping to manage those pilots, I was able to come in in this role. Fantastic. And it's great when you see you both have such um, diverse and such valuable experiences, and when you can see those, and then you can see that things can be better, you yeah. want to be part of it. You exactly. kind of get the bug as you say, like, wow, if we could do this and do this, and when it really works, it changes people's lives, especially young yep. adults who are very open to change if, if they believe it's for the better. Right. So it's fantastic. So that kind of leads us, Joan, into the grant. Tell us about the Stay Together grant. Well, I'm going to tell you about the grant, but before I do that, um, I need to just tell you a little bit about the Children's Behavioral Health Services. Fantastic. Because yes. it's one of those services that we're building upon okay. um, to really try to engage older adolescents and young adults up to their 21st birthday in a different way. Yes. Um, Emily will give you more of a history of the remedy okay. and all of the services, but the one particular one we're looking at uh, operates out of 32 community service agencies across the Commonwealth. And um, a service called intensive care coordination um, and family partners are available to children and their families up to their 21st birthday um, using what's called a wraparound approach to uh, care planning. Um, so we uh, implemented the service in the Commonwealth, what I think, Emily, Two. July of 2009. Nine. Yep. And two years into it, 
um, enormously successful in terms of how many youth and families have actually taken advantage of the service. Oh, fantastic. But as yeah. we honed in further in terms of populations, we were particularly interested in young adults, 18, 19, 20 year olds who um, were eligible for the service. We wanted to look at the question of how many of them were actually accessing the resource. And after fairly, I don't know if it's rigid analysis or rigorous analysis, but in fact the answer is not many. Ooh. Young people are voting with their feet. <laughs> they either don't know of the service or if they know about it, don't feel comfortable accessing it or don't feel that the service is really relevant for them, nor can it help them achieve the goals they want to achieve. And um, as a larger children's behavioral health group, we were really committed to taking a deeper look at that. So that's exactly what the grant does. Um, we have selected six community service agencies across the Commonwealth, one in Springfield, one in Worcester, one in Lawrence, um, one on the Cape, one in Boston, and one in Framingham. Mm -hmm. And we are working with those six community service agencies and their teams to create relevance for young adults. And the question obviously is how are we going to do that? Right. Um, I think the way we're going to do that is to work closely with young adults because it's young people who will tell us what we need to do to respond best to their problems, their issues, and their needs. And I know you are interviewing for this show a number of young people who are very articulate about needs, about yes. concerns, about worries. So our goal is to create a plan uh, where older adolescents and young adults are not only willing to access the service, but potentially are excited about accessing the service because it gives them what they need. Absolutely. So to find the right match, and that's find what we're the right match. all looking for, find is the right to match. find the right match. And we just had uh, Sophia McLaren come on from the Transformation Center, yes. who was a young adult, and she was talking about the services didn't meet her needs when she was going through them and how she loves to advocate now and connect people up to, wow, these are what's out there now. How do you access them and how do we draw in more people? And she sees that as a, a very big piece of her recovery mm. and to help other people in their recovery. Um, right. So it's a really neat We are piece. all still right. learning in this yes. country, not only in Massachusetts, but in the country, about this age group. Yes. Uh, parents are no longer in charge. Uh, individuals have reached their 18th birthday. They're adults, yet obviously still need family, need family as support. Um, how, do we, how do we need to change the system to better respond? We have adult services, which are also successful, but then there's the, this bridge, bridge yes. gap really, of college-age youth um, and slightly older um, who have very particular issues and needs that they're confronting. Right. No, absolutely. And we talk about kind of there's a, a remedy, and you had mentioned this, Emily. What There's a Rosie Deed lawsuit that kind right. of um, <laughs> we want to tell us a little bit about the history and how yep. that came about. Yep. So um, it came about in 2000. Um, a, a group of lawyers, um, public sector lawyers, represented a class, a group, of young people with mental health issues and um, sued the state saying that the Medicaid program was not fulfilling its obligations to folks with mental health issues. And if, if I can just take a minute, it's interesting to note the law they sued us under is something called EPSTDT, which stands for Early Periodic Screening, Diagnosis, and Treatment. And what's interesting, it was passed in the 70s in Congress. And at the time, the whole point was to make sure that young people and kids on Medicaid got well child visits. That was, that was really the intent of the oh, legislation. Okay. But it's written, it's a very strong entitlement, which means it guarantees access to services. Okay. States can't say, we don't have enough money. Okay. As long as you meet the, the um, eligibility requirements for the service, the state with the Medicaid program has to deliver screening, diagnosis, and treatment. So advocates have taken this law and used it to look at the two areas they've looked at across the country in several states is mental health treatment and dental care. Oh, interesting. And so just like in the commercial insurance world, those aren't necessarily as fully covered as the medical right. conditions, right? 
So it, what was interesting in our case is it wasn't that Massachusetts did such a poor job. We actually had a lot of services available, but they were typical services like outpatient care or oh, inpatient okay. care or maybe family stabilization teams, but it was really to prevent a hospitalization right. or to help someone come home, right? And so this, this was a question of what's the responsibility of the Medicaid program to have home and community-based services wow. ongoing, okay. intensive wow. for kids and families who need them. And so it was a really an open question. And we just heard the judge speak recently, Judge Ponzer, at a public event. And he said, I didn't know how it was going to turn out. You know, it was a really open right. question in the law. Wow. So it did come down that, yes, this law guarantees that if you have a medical, uh, mental health condition, we're responsible, the state's responsible for diagnosing it and treating it. So then I can tell you quickly what we did to sort of answer that. Is that? Yes, okay. absolutely. So the parts of the, of the remedy, so this is to remedy the fact that we are out of compliance with the law, um, fit that structure. So first of all, we, we instituted now when a child or young adult on mass health goes for a regular checkup, the doctor offers to do a behavioral health screen. And it's usually a, like a pencil and paper um, you know, form that you fill out in the waiting room. Right. And research shows that you double the rate of identifying a problem if you use one of these tools as wow. opposed to just talking about it. Yep. Okay. So that's happening now. Wow. So like about, you know, in the high 70% of kids going for a checkup get a behavioral health screen. So that's the screening part. Diagnosis was um, the court wanted to make sure that wherever you go, whether, what different kind of therapist you go to or where you go in the state, everybody gets asked the same questions about their health. Oh, wow, okay. And so that's the CANS, Child and right. Adolescent Needs and Strengths tool. And that just, that mainly is to make sure that everybody gets a good assessment wherever they are. So that's the diagnosis part. And then the treatment, it's intensive care coordination that Jane talked, uh, Jane, Joe talked about. And um, also um, in-home therapy, which is kind of like the old family stabilization teams, right. but it's not limited to Stabilization. It's whatever the child and family needs. Right. It can be anything can from be, budgeting to, you know. Well, kind of. it's, it's got to be around a mental health condition. Okay. So this is a medical program, so it has to be about a mental health condition and treating that condition. But it's quite broad okay. other than it that. It can be some life skills, but not. Yeah. It's got to be life skills really tied in yeah. neatly with them. And it can be health. to help the parents manage the needs of the child. Okay. And so a key, a key service for that is the family partner. And family partners are adults who themselves have had experience taking care of a child or could be a sibling, could be someone who's had special needs, maybe mental health needs, and they sort of become coaches and mentors. Which is a families. fantastic model. Absolutely I mean, fantastic. The parents that I've talked to really respond to that I've actually helped people become family advocates or family right. partners. And they just, it's, it's a, the peer movement. I right. mean, someone that's exactly. been there, done that. Exactly. You know, it and really, really resonates. Really knows what you're mm -hmm. going for, can yes. bring you hope, can say yes. it gets better. You know, exactly. all those great things. And we've heard just rave, rave reviews yes. about that. It's kind of a similar thing, therapeutic mentors yes. are for young people. And again, it, it, you know, Medicaid's a medical program, so it has to be tied to there's something that a clinician, a therapist, has said, this child needs help with right. whatever, and then the, the therapeutic mentor will do that work. Um, also something called um, in-home behavioral services. That's kind of a specialty, and it's for, it, it brings in clini clinicians who know how to do what are called functional behavioral assessments. Mm -hmm. um, so that can be particularly for kids who maybe are on the autism spectrum, um, or have a developmental disability, and talk therapy is not really going to work. So you right. need something else to help the family and the child. And last of all, um, mobile crisis intervention. So that is mobile crisis can go to wherever the young person or child is, school, after school, home, whatever, can come in early in a crisis. It's not just about whether you need to go to the hospital, um, but can help manage the crisis. And if there's a need to go someplace else, can help make that happen. Fantastic. So it's a lot of wonderful services that go around, and they're based a lot of on what the individuals who are experiencing themselves said, this is what we need, and this is the kind of flexibility we need, yes. and this is what kind of response time we need. Yes. We can make a huge difference in people's recovery. Yes. And just so you know, the values in all the services, so how they were designed, 
how we have trained providers, um, all the, basically the training and technical assistance, it's all about partnering with families and partnering with young people. So it's not the old expert model of we'll tell you what to do, but it really, really is joining with people and trying to collaboratively find out what's going to help and what's going to make things better. Fantastic, fantastic. Joan, is there anything you want to add to that? I think just to say that of the, for the young people that I've talked with, in the stay population, mm -hmm. which is really the 17, 18, 19, and 20 year olds, okay. one of the things that resonates with them is therapeutic mentoring. Yes, um, absolutely. It's practical, it's, it's relevant, um, it's really based on the particular needs that's identified by the young person. Um, so it's a, it's a decent fit. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I do think that the young people at, in that age group are taking advantage of it. I think w the other thing that young people are telling us is that they love the family partner piece because it helps their moms oh. or it helps their folks. Um, parents whose children are in this age group a, they no longer have the kind of control that they used to have. Right. B, they're not exactly sure what to do and what the resources are that are available. And just as you use the been there, done that comment, um, it's important for them to relate to people who have been there and done that. And so having a family partner and meeting people who have been through the system um, and can sort of guide them is extremely helpful. Um, mm -hmm. So those are, those are two yeah. of the services that really resonate um, based on folks that we've, we've chatted with. Right, and that's been my experience too. Danny Walsh, we had her on the cable show yeah. a couple weeks back, and she was really into her therapeutic, therapeutic mentor. Um, just there's some power in that, you know, and, and, and that's used in, in so many other things, not only in mental health, whether it's, you right. know, you're having a new baby, you want someone to chat with, you're surviving cancer, you want someone, you're going to train for a marathon. Everyone wants to look to someone who's kind of navigated out that process and can really speak to that. And I think the, the, in, the family partners in, in like combination with the therapeutic partners in combination with the family partners, are just there's a synergy that happens that people feel very supported by people who they feel are in the know, um, which is a critical piece. You have to really look up to and respect the people who you're asking advice from. Right. You know, language is really important. Yes. And so the, the word mentor connotes what? Coach. Guy, right. Everyone would advisor. like. I would love a mentor. I you would know. love a mentor. We <laughs> right. would all we would love more <laughs> mentors. Right. Exactly. Therapist is can be off-putting. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. What does it mean? Care coordinator. What is a care coordinator? Right. What does that right. mean? Family right. partner. Maybe good for my mother. Maybe good for my parents. Um, but a mentor. You resonate with a mentor. Yeah. And so somehow building on the language of mentor as we try to figure out how to. Uh, recruit essentially more young people on mass health into the community service agency array of services is going to be important. Yeah. Right, I think that's going to be a critical piece. So as we think about this in terms of Massachusetts, how does Massachusetts stack up in terms of kind of how are we doing in comparison to other states? We'll have Joan first answer. Well, you know, um, I, I, I see all the deficits <laughs> but in Massachusetts. Um, but when I hear about what's going on in the rest of the country, we're way ahead of the game. Um, we've identified the needs and the issues. Um, the Department of Mental Health actually, over the last eight years, has made a huge investment and a commitment into a group that we've historically called transition age youth. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's the best language. Um, we have a number of services in various parts of the state. It's not part of a standard package, but there are uh, programs dealing with independent living. There are specialized housing situations in Boston for young people. Uh, there's a specialized service in the western part of the state uh, for young people in this age group that's part of the DMH adult system. Uh, we actually are very fortunate to have Marianne Davis and yes. um, her research center uh, here in as part of UMass Medical School, mm -hmm. uh, which is focused exclusively on this population. Mm -hmm. So we've done a lot and we have scratched the surface. Uh, I think we know the questions. I think we have a good sense of the problems. Now we've got to steamroll toward solutions and solutions that are not just going to work in Lawrence or just going to work on the Cape uh, or just going to work based on local leadership yes. but really are going to work for the for the young people of the Commonwealth. And that's really part of what this project is about. Yeah. 
And I want to just say, building on these new mass health services, um, we, we're lucky with this lawsuit in that um, we have a statewide system. Um, in most states, these services are just for kids kind of at the top of the pile in terms of their needs, oh, okay. the, the most kids with the most significant needs. Mm -hmm. This is really quite wide open. I mean, you have to have, um, you know, significant mental health needs. But we've served so far just in so it's uh, two years in intensive care coordination and in in-home therapy together over 22,000 children wow. and youth. Yeah. Wow. So there's a really, I mean, that's mm -hmm. why we're so excited about this grant because mm -hmm. we've got this this basis in the mm -hmm. Medicaid program, which is an entitlement, and that so much matters with what's going on in Washington mm -hmm. around deficit, you know, cutting the budget and all those things. There's legal entitlement to these services. So we're really excited about um, partnering with young adults to say, okay, how do we need to make this look a little mm -hmm. different? How do we need to run it a little bit differently so it's going to work better for you? Right, and that's a fantastic place to be because you you have the resources in a very challenging economic right. time to say, okay, what do you need? And we have a real um, facility to a really uh, set of resources that we can connect them up, and that's right. amazing. And right. and then other states will look to Massachusetts to say, well, what went well? What you know? What were the challenges? How do we move forward in this way? Right. We've also got some infrastructure that is unique, I think, in Massachusetts. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, our mental health planning council many years ago established a transition age youth subcommittee mm -hmm. and that transition age youth subcommittee has evolved into uh, the development of the statewide young adult council mm -hmm. um, the youth development committee I mean we have programs that uh, bring young adults in and who assume leadership roles on policy issues on play issues on uh, relevant concerns related to mental health uh, looking at housing uh, looking at education, vocational training. So the, the infrastructure actually has been built. Um, it's a question of fanning out and really making sure that there's a receiver for the recommendations that come out of these groups uh, that will uh, enable us to put the pieces in place that will make a difference for young adults. And so recruitment becomes a key piece of this to really get to these diverse young adults to match them up with the services. Because right, we could have these fantastic services, and you've got the infrastructure, but if you don't, if you're not getting to the key young mm -hmm. adults who need the services, well, and this is where you mentioned both Sophia and Danny. Uh, Sophia and Danny are are two key recruiters. Absolutely, uh, they're Absolutely. working uh, very hard on this grant. Yes. One representing the Transformation Center, the other uh, Youth Move yes. and, and PAL. Um, and we'll be recruiting other young people to talk about relevance. What yes. do you need? What do you want? Mm -hmm. How do we need to structure this? What do wraparound services look like for 19 and 20 year olds? Yes. It's very different than what they look like for seven and eight or 12 and 13 year olds. Yes. What are the needs of the families? Very different uh, for young adults than, than they are for uh, younger children and adolescents. So they'll be the key uh, opening this uh, treasure trove, uh, we're not sure what's in it yet, but but they're going to play a huge part. Yes, absolutely. Right. Well, I think that's a key piece. And what do you what are you thinking in terms of how do we how do we move forward with the young adults in terms of as we kind of we're in the process of kind of wrapping up? What is the message for young adults? We'll go to Emily and then to Joan. Kind of if a young adult is thinking, "Wow, this sounds fantastic. Why should I get involved, or how do I get involved?" Okay, well, just in terms of finding out more about the services, you can go to the mass.gov website, and it's mass.gov slash masshealth okay. <laughs> slash CBHI, which stands for Children's Behavioral Health Initiative, and there's information about the services and how to get them, and, and lists. The important thing is there are providers all over the state, and you can just call up and um, go talk to them. And if you're interested in the Great. service. Um, I think um, you can talk about sort of how people could connect to the grant initiative. Mm -hmm. I think just that we're really excited about working with young people and we will be able to, to make changes that are going to make these services more relevant mm -hmm. for young people. So. Fantastic. I think a, a big piece has nothing to do with state government or any of our direct work, but it's for young people and their families mm -hmm. to know that they're not alone. Yes. Most young yep. people 
unless they're already involved. I'm not talking about Sophia. I'm not talking about Danny. Right. Most young people think they are the only ones yes. who are experiencing um, some really significant challenges. Yeah. And you know, last week there was an article in the press uh, citing SAMHSA's new data, which basically said 20% of the adult population in the United States suffers from a mental illness during the course of a year. 29.9% of young people in the 18 to, I think it was 25 category. Uh, and then it drops to 14% if you're after 55. <laughs> so for, for young people to realize that what they're experiencing, other people are experiencing. Yes. You look at the person next door and you may it may not show, right. but what's going on internally is very different. And there are lots of ways to help. There are lots of ways to relieve depression, to relieve anxiety, to address other behavioral health conditions. Um, taking that first step, and if that first step means talking with another young adult, we can make it happen. Right, yeah. fantastic. We have lots of ways to link up, just going to a, a statewide youth council meeting or exactly. um, going to Transformation Center for a Speaking of Hope. So there are lots of ways to get involved. So to check out the websites, to get to DMH, to look at these providers and just say, you know, kind of what's a first step? I think that's really the message that you're saying is to reach out to people. Yeah. Um, and that's critical. I'd like to thank you very much, Emily, for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Joan, for being a returning guest. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Gets easier every time. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. We'll have you on again. Mm -hmm. um, and this is terrific information for young adults, and it's very inspiring to hear about what are the services and how we can really respond to the transitional age youth or the youth and young adults and make the services meaningful for them and, and help them move forward in their recovery. Well, thanks for your work, Kim. You've thank done you. amazing, amazing feats uh, with young adults around your cable show and around training and coaching peer mentors. Thank yeah. you, thank you. No, it's been a real privilege to work with young adults, and I think I've learned more from them than right. <laughs> they've learned from me. Right. It's been a real, it's a really exciting opportunity. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to say thank you to our guests for once again turning into Employment for All, where we believe that everyone can be successful with the right supports. We'd like you to look out for that one young person who might just be in need of a little extra support because you might be the person to help them reach their full potential. And we'd like to also say thank you to the Department of Mental Health for being a key support in our success here at Employment for All. So thank you very much. This is Kim Bissett saying have a wonderful day. Take care.